I'm breathing underwater, I'm weightless through space. I'm soaring like an eagle all over this place. Creatures most will never see are waiting there to look at me. And all I got to do is breathe underwater. Today's story begins in some sort of tropical looking jungle. A man looks like an American is running away from something that sounds big and angry. It's definitely big, but it doesn't appear to be especially angry. Hungry, maybe. Or it may not even care that that guy is there. It's hard to tell. That thing he's carrying is a plastic balloon of some sort. He'll make his way to a small beach, gather a bunch of rocks, then start inflating the bag from that tube that's sticking out of it. I guess it's supposed to float him away from the lizard, but why the rocks? Because he intends to make his journey on the bottom and breathe off that thing. Considering the size of the bag, I hope it's a short trip. Carol? Just a minute, I'm in the dark room. Lee, what a pleasant surprise. Come on in, I'll be with you in a minute. Seeing Yvonne Craig is always a pleasant surprise. I've talked about her many times, especially when she was Batgirl and I was doing Adamania. And once again, as I watch her do something as simple as walk across the room, I'm struck by how her every movement looks like a smooth dance. She started out as a dancer, as we know, and her body never forgot. She's in her dark room hanging up some pictures that she just developed, and even when she's going like this, you can almost hear music behind her. She doesn't walk, she doesn't reach, she doesn't even run. She glides. It's a bit awe-inspiring. Although to klutzes like me, it's a bit depressing too, because we know even in our absolute prime, we never had that kind of body control. I've got some news about Jason Kemp. They found his body. They found him. He's alive, Carol. What about Dad and the others? Just Jason. It's a miracle. A man lost for nine months in the Antarctic, and then he suddenly turns up. An icebreaker found him. Jason is her boyfriend. He, her dad, and two men from the Nelson Institute went down in a diving bell off the coast of Antarctica. Something happened, the cable on the diving bell snapped, and the bell with its inhabitants was lost. Everyone assumed the whole expedition was dead. They were wrong. Crane is there to gather her onto the sea view and take her to Jason. I wish I knew the answer, but I don't. I don't. You look marvelous. You're still my girl. I'm sorry, Admiral Nelson, but it isn't every day a man returns from the grave. I can think of three instances, and they're all recorded in the same book. Of course, Jason. We hate to press you, but if you could remember anything about what happened. Jason, if Dad was killed, you, you must tell me. I can stand anything but not knowing. I don't know. I keep trying, but nothing comes. Intense trauma does that. I remember almost nothing from the night of my heart attack. My mind has blacked out all but a couple of little flashes of things. I know the pain I experienced was the worst I have ever felt, and that's probably why my brain doesn't want to go back and look at it. Considering he was being chased by dinosaurs, I can empathize with his forgetfulness. Carol was on the icebreaker that launched his diving bell, but she can't tell him anything they haven't already discussed. He's still drawing a complete blank. Our other guest star is Nick Adams. No, this guy isn't a pathetic weenie. This Nick Adams was born in 1931 and grew up wanting to be a movie star. Friendships with James Dean and Elvis Presley helped him break into the business, and he's best known for playing Johnny Yuma, the lead character in the Western series The Rebel. He had a good career going, but had some issues with nerves. His doctor prescribed some stuff for him to deal with it, but forgot that he was already taking some other medication. 
A bad drug interaction killed him almost the moment he took the pills. He was 36. Concerns about things like drug interactions weren't a big thing in the early 60s, but I like to hope that tragedies like his helped lead to greater diligence about such things. On the plane that brought him here, he did some talking into a tape recorder. Everybody assumes he was delirious. Ah, the stinking jungle. Run five yards and you swear like a... What's that? You hear it? Do you hear it? It's coming closer. Quiet, quiet. Don't move. There. There, look. What is it? A monster. When it's that big and you don't know its name, that's what you call it. Get back. Get back. Get back. No. No! The doctor says tropical jungles and monsters in Antarctica? Obviously impossible. Tell me, doctor, how long do you expect a man to survive in the Antarctic? Uh, a man dressed as lightly as Jason Kemp was when he was picked up. Well, it's hard to say. Not more than a day, certainly. But Kemp had been there for nine long months. He shows no signs of undue exposure. As a matter of fact, he looks to me like a man who spent a long time in a tropical climate. He points out that there are places on the Antarctic coast that are 50 degrees due to volcanic activity. Antarctica had scarcely been explored even by flyovers in 1964, so nobody knew what we might find somewhere in the interior of the continent. To a certain degree, we still don't. As a man of science, Doctor, you should be as careful as I am about using the word impossible. The best science leaves possibilities open for most anything that can be imagined. 150 years ago, the idea of people flying was laughable. Now we're not only flying all over our own planet, we're going to the moon, Mars, and all kinds of other places. Proper science doesn't say that's impossible. It says, I don't know if it's doable. The doctor found one puzzling thing, a bit of what looks like an esophagus stuck to Jason's plastic bag. His biologist friends can't identify the animal. Nelson plays a hunch and takes it to a paleontologist friend of his. What you have here is a section of the esophagus of that little fellow, Edifosaurus. Dinosaur. From the Mesozoic era, probably the Jurassic period. He says it must be 150 million years old, but according to Wikipedia, he's got his timeline wrong. This guy lived around 300 million years ago. But once you get past a couple million, who's counting? So, is that how old it is? I cannot believe it. You've tricked me. Tricked you? My friend, creatures like this have been extinct for ages, eons. This one? No. This one year ago, Harriman. One year ago, it was alive. It's possible the creature still is, just that piece of esophagus is dead now. And how did Jason come to have a piece of its esophagus anyway? I doubt the lizard was trying to eat him. That particular one was a plant eater. So if he got in its mouth deep enough to snag a piece of its esophagus, he either crawled in there deliberately or fell in by accident. Either way, I could begin to wonder about Jason. My thanks to Crane for taking care of my girl all the time I was missing. See you later. We'll see another spot where Jason appears to be jealous of Lee, and it'll go nowhere, so it really doesn't matter. They load the sea view with a diving bell exactly like the one Jason was in before, and they head out to the spot where it was lost. Let's go see if we can find out what happened. It's almost unbelievable. 59 degrees Fahrenheit. That's warmer than Puget Sound in the summer. At 100 fathoms, it warms up to nearly 70. A good scientist would call that an anomaly. I'm not a good scientist or bad scientist or any scientist at all, so I'll just call it weird. This is the spot where the other bell disappeared. Jason says everything started happening at 4,000 feet. Nelson, Crane, Jason, and Carol will go down to that depth in the bell and see what happens. We established that Carol is probably the best underwater photographer there is, so she'll take pictures all the way down. So far, she's getting lots of pictures of bubbles. Still no current, no tidal search? None. And 
there's lots more bubbles for her to take pictures of. Crane tells Curly to haul them in, but the cable breaks just like the other one did, and they're swept into a cave. That looks like the same beach where Jason was running from the dinosaur. Is it still hanging around? Jason! Remarkable. Possibly leave a huge print like that. That looks to me like the distinctive track of the tree toad tree toad. And that a thesaurus. Okay, it could be that too. And to answer my own question, yes, it's still hanging around. Lest anyone presume, that's not a quote-unquote girly thing. She's perfectly capable of running away on her own. She's calling him because he's got the rifle. For all the good it's doing. They take shelter below a cliff while that thing keeps ambling along. And suddenly we learn that it brought a friend. Okay, friend may have been too strong a word. Lizard fight! If this looks familiar, you probably saw Irwin Allen's 1960 movie, The Lost World. The dinosaur stuff is lifted wholesale from it. Cut in the shots of Crane and Carol and you have a whole new show. As we've seen many times, that was an Irwin Allen trademark, reusing props, footage, and anything else he could to keep costs down. In this case, it was necessary. In the movie, he had wanted to use stop-action figures for the dinosaur stuff, but the studio wouldn't give him the budget for it. Those are real live monitor lizards, and they're really fighting each other. Were they harmed? We don't know. But gluing a bunch of prosthetics onto a pair of critters and then making them fight wouldn't go over well today, and rightly so. This battle goes on for a long time as befits a feature-length movie. Except this isn't a feature-length movie, so in the setting of a TV episode, it's a bit too long. And since our two humans are hiding under a cliff, guess what happens next? If you had Monsters Fall Off Conveniently Placed Cliff on your bingo card, mark that spot now. Jason and the Admiral found a campsite of sorts that they want to check out, but Crane just spotted something way more interesting. Wait! Gosh! A lady! He'll chase her down and try to make friends. Grabbing a woman by the thingamabobs and wrestling her into submission is the universal sign for I want to be friends. Bet you didn't know that. That compass indicates that it was his previous team who camped here. He doesn't want the others to know that, but we don't know why. Where'd you find her? She's scared half to death. Amarinda, I'd say. Notice the high cheekbones, the characteristic eye folds. She's nothing of the kind. Her name is Vettina Marcus, and she's from New York. She was a minor favorite of Irwin Allen's, and we've seen her before. 
if we don't recognize her, it's an honest mistake. The last time we saw her, she was green, wore a clear bowl on her head, and was floating around in space trying to convince Dr. Smith to join her. South America's not too far away. There may be a colony of them. One of their primitive canoes might have been swept here centuries ago by a storm. Denning? Dr. Denning? And she's not alone. They have a makeshift prison in a cave. That sacrificial altar out there. Is that for us? Ceremony to the fire guy. At high noon on the longest day of the year. That's a day. Less than half an hour. Less than half an hour, we're all dead. Weird things were happening on the way here, and the Admiral suspected Jason was trying to sabotage the trip. The question is, why? What's he so afraid of? You wanted my father dead. Why, Jason? Why? I didn't want anyone dead, I swear to you, not anyone. I'm beginning to understand now, part of it at least. When you left here, Denning was alive. You knew if you didn't come back until after the fire guard ceremony, he'd be dead. What are you afraid of, Jason? What can Denning tell us about you? I think we're about to find out. Don't look at me like that. How can any of you know what you would have done in my place? You don't know what it was like. But I know, Jason. Dad. Believe it or not, under all that hair is Les Tremaine, mentor from Filmation's Shazam series. And does he have a story to tell? So you did get away, Jason. I wondered about that. Herod and Younger weren't so lucky, were they? Are they dead? Will you tell them, or shall I? I'm not sure he can speak right now. You'd better tell it. It probably sounds better coming through fur anyway. There was a girl who fell in love with him. He used her to escape. But Herod and Younger... Tell them! I didn't know they'd be killed! He knew. He used them. He deliberately led Herod and Younger into a trap. While they died, he slipped away. And now we know why he tried to delay coming here until after the natives killed the doctor, and why he tried to shoot the girl. They can all testify that he sacrificed two other men to save his own skin. Datu. Condemned men were expected to eat a hearty meal. That's who. Don't let her leave. Even though he betrayed her, the girl still has feelings for Jason. He'll try to convince her to open the door, but she's afraid of the guard. By this time, the world had a couple of James Bond movies under its collective belt, and Admiral Nelson is taking a page out of the Master Spy's book. Poison tip? Not poison, a paralyzing drug. He keeps a collapsible blowgun with a knockout dart in the heel of his shoe. How very British. The dart keeps the guard down just long enough. Will that take us to the pool? another way out. It's a cave by the big water, but dangerous, very dangerous. And the rest of this place isn't? A fire monster. She may mean a volcano, a lava flow of some kind. Where will this take us? That's the pool. I vote for the pool. Or not. How about that other way? She leads them along a narrow ledge over a bubbling lava pool. The locals try to follow, but can't. They're safe from that threat, at least. (laughs) 
and they know somebody's been here before because if that cave opening is a natural formation, so is this mouse. That's her native language for, I'm not as crazy as you are. I know the book of Revelation talks about monsters rising out of the sea and stuff, but this is ridiculous. We'll never get by. Leave. We can break that dam, the lava will pour out and kill it. There's a convenient log sticking out of it that can serve as a nice lever to pull it apart. The professor says once that dam breaks, we'll need to get out of here quick because that hot lava hitting the cold water and ice will cause an explosion. Crane will go knock it loose, but he has a problem. He can't get past the lizard. Try and attract his attention. <laughs> I think we all know why he did that, and it definitely got the monster's attention. I'm wondering if that's one of the same little dolls he used in Land of the Giants and how much repair it needed after that thing bit it. Crane reaches the dam and uses the log to push it over the edge. That's a lousy way to go, even for a dinosaur. The next series of caves takes them out to the cold Antarctic coast, and them without their mittens. And isn't that convenient? They're searching all around for the diving bell and they just happen to come up right where our heroes are standing. Well, we had to wrap this whole thing up within the allotted runtime somehow. Curly will send out a rescue boat and all is well except that Dinosaur never got to finish digesting Jason. gone forever. We have nothing to show for it. Carol should have her pictures. I'm more concerned that we just wiped out an entire lost civilization. Nobody will mention that. She took her pictures to several scientists, but even with her father's word, nobody believed her. Then a certain producer got wind of them and he bought them for a small fortune. He said there was no end to the movies and TV shows he could make out of something like that. I'm breathing underwater, I'm weightless through space. I'm soaring like an eagle all over this place. Creatures most will never see are waiting there to look at me. And all I gotta do is breathe underwater. Today's story begins in some sort of... He's running away from... Jeez, okay. Ideas like his help to lead great to... A bad drug interact and... Inter, in, oh, come on, David. Monsters fall off conveniently placed... Conveniently, I can say that. Monsters fall conveniently... Uh, oh, good grief, come on. But they want that... Catch, catch up. Well, we had to wrap this whole thing up within the allotted time somehow. Boy, I screwed that all up.